Welcome to our latest 76 Capital Leadership Series. My name is Wayne Kimmel and I'm your host. And of course, we have our great producer and my chief of staff, James Santor, at the controls, making sure everything goes right. And we have a great guest today. Uh, well, first of all, before we get to that, we should definitely make sure that you follow uh, James at James Santor 76. And uh, you can follow me, Wayne Kimmel, at Wayne Kimmel. But we have a great guest today, and I'm really excited that we have uh, Peter Luco, the chairman of the Oakview Group. Um, it, it's he's the you know he runs all the facilities work for the for Oakview Group. He's the co-chairman of OVG's Arena Alliance. He was the uh, he's been the executive chairman of the Florida Panthers. Uh, he's involved was involved with Comcast Spectacor for over 25 years, where he was the president and chief operating officer and oversaw the Flyers and the Philadelphia 76ers when they owned them. He's been a National um, Hockey League Board of Governor, uh, has incredible relationships in the hockey world, uh, knows everything about operations and, and how to really run arenas. And we're going to hear some really great stories and some things, that all the great things that um, my good friend Peter Luco has done in his career so far. And man, are they doing some really exciting things right now. But as many of you know, 76 Capital Leadership Series, we do this series because we're all about trying to reach out to the entrepreneurs, the executives, the athletes who want to hear about what's happening in business. What are the next, next things in the sports business? We want to talk to you as an entrepreneur at 76 Capital. We want to hear your ideas. We want to reach out and be able to find ways that we potentially we could even become investors in your company and really work to hear what are the next, next things in sports, whether it's esports, whether it's sports betting, whether it's just really incredible new technology and data collection and data ideas and analytics around the sports industry. We want to talk with you. We want to learn from you. You can follow us it's on 76 Capital, whether it's on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, our YouTube channel, you could subscribe to that. And also now our, all of our leadership series are done on as podcasts as well. So all your favorite podcast networks, you can hear these shows. And also at 76 Capital, we have the 76 Capital Sports Advisory Business where we're working and consulting with sports teams and leagues and conferences and athletes and brands. That's a really new, exciting part of everything that we're doing at 76 Capital. But most importantly, we're here today because we have an incredible guest. We have my good friend, Peter Luco, the chairman of the Oakview Group Facilities and co-chairman of OVG's Arena Alliance. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, it's great to be on. I, you know, when you were uh, doing your preamble, I was thinking years ago when uh, we used to, you'd be courtside at, at a Sixer game and flyer games sometimes hanging out in the director's lounge so uh it's been a lot of fun over the years and and now uh you know probably going to be working with you on some esports concepts so uh you know when your mom tells you don't burn bridges it probably is not a bad idea right <laughs> well that's a great piece of advice and it's certainly something that you know i'm excited to talk with you about and all the great things that you've done in the sports world i mean you've Truly been a trailblazer, um, done incredible things throughout your career. And I think it'll be really interesting for uh, our audience to hear all the things that you've done. And, and one of the things that we do on our 76 Capital Leadership Series, really to start things off, is you know, to hear some of the background. So where you, you know, where you grew up and and kind of what made you the person you are that you are today. Well, uh, as they say, I'm a I'm a mass hole. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts. Uh we were always called that when we played hockey in any other state. Uh, but I'm, I'm from a, a little town outside Worcester, Mass. Uh, and um, I went to school uh, at the uh, University of Massachusetts. Uh, I actually, my through a friend of a friend, my father actually introduced me to somebody who was working at the Boston Bruins. And uh, it said, how my son wants to get in this business. He plays hockey. Uh, what do you do? And they actually sent me uh, to the University of Massachusetts. And it was a sport management program. Uh, it was one of the first sport management programs in the country. And it was really, uh, it was groundbreaking at the time. Now there's a number of sport management programs. Uh, as as I, obviously this business has become even more of a business. But I, I went there. I, I came out of there. I was hired off an internship at, at, at the New Haven Coliseum, uh, the old New Haven Nighthawks. Uh, 
it was the end of sort of the slap shot era. So we used to say, uh, you know, great fights on the ice, better fights in the stands. Uh, and uh, that was before Family Affordable Fund. Um, so I, I was there. I was work uh, in Providence for the city of Providence, uh, the famous money uh, mayor, Buddy Cianci. That's where I actually became great friends with Lou Lamorello. I've literally been friends with Lou since 1983. Um, we now work together as he's the uh, president of the Islanders Hockey Ops. Um, but really, my, my real break was in, I was hired in 1985 by Tony Tavares to, to work for Ed Snyder at Spectacor. And from there, I, I went out and I ran the LA Coliseum and Sports Arena. And uh, our tenants were the Raiders and, and the Clippers. So I actually worked with, uh, you know, Al Davis and, and Donald Sterling, two famous and infamous owners, uh, becoming unbelievably great friends with Al Davis. He's, he's he, you know, he was at times malign, but he very much like Ed Snyder, he made his money uh, through sports and he was very dynamic and a very smart man. Um, that's where, as crazy as it sounds, that's where I really got to know Ed was in California. He was spending a lot of time out there. Um, and I was more of the junior guy in this deal at the time, but uh, I worked with Tony and Ed to, we actually kept the Raiders in LA. It was a big, big media story at the time. Um, and we cut a deal with Al Davis to stay in LA. Um, as I got to know Ed, he didn't realize that I had this hockey background. Um, so he asked me in, in, in 1993 to come back and be president at that time of the spectrum, but also take over some of the business duties uh, of the Flyers. And then from there, I became um, president of both. Uh, we built uh, what is now the Wells Fargo Center. Uh, we kept the spectrum. Uh, we, we bought the uh, American Hockey League expansion team. We put the uh, Philadelphia Phantoms there. We did the deal with Comcast, and they brought the Sixers to the table. We formed Comcast Spectacor. So we had the Sixers, the Flyers, the Phantoms, the two arenas. We started, which is really interesting, uh, Comcast's first sports network, which was Comcast Sportsnet. And obviously now you see the success of, of Brian Roberts and what he's done. It's just unbelievable. Um, and then during that period, we had been in the management business. That's why I was in L.A. Uh, we sold our interest in SMG, and then we started, uh, at the time, Global Spectrum, started Ovation's Food Service, and then Paculum Ticketing. Um, and, you know, obviously ran those for many years. And then in 2013, uh, as Ed was doing more of his estate planning and, and, and beginning to move on himself. I sold all my interests uh, back to Comcast and and left the company then. Uh, and then about a year later, I was working for the Florida. Uh, Gary Bettman and called me and said- Well, Peter, before you, before you get there, I, I want to yeah. jump in for a second because sure. I think it's fascinating what you did here um, in Philadelphia um, as, as president and COO of Comcast Spectacor. And you, you made a point where you talked about Al Davis and Ed Snyder, how they made money in sports. And as did you, right? right. And you, you know, so, but that's, the, but you know, you think now, nowadays with all the excitement with sports betting and esports and, you know, all these teams being valued at billions of dollars, that wasn't the case back. Great, great point, Wayne. I mean, you know, Al Davis slowly was the coach of the Raiders, believe it or not. And he was coaching and he bought out the minority pieces. Ed Snyder's story is off the charts. Um, you know, people look at, at Ed and he had that look. He, he looked like a millionaire billionaire. But Ed, you know, was a VP with the Eagles from Washington, self-made man, and, and literally um, bought, the, bought the Flyers with – an advance on food service commissions, a, a couple of investors put a, you know, look, got a loan on his, on his home and, and bought the Philadelphia Flyers, took the spectrum out of bankruptcy by paying the creditors a hundred cents on the dollar, which is unheard of, and then built everything from there. So, I, you know, Wayne, and you know this better anyway, you can't do that today. It just could not happen at all. Um, it, you know, when you're talking about these valuations and the billions. Um, so it, it was a fun time, you know, sort of, I was very fortunate enough to sort of be in those years from the sports entrepreneur 
to the to the wealthy owner, whether it's a corporation or an individual. And you know the characters of the game uh, and and in the business. Then you know when you when you meet Eddie Einhorn in the Reinsdorf family, who's still in this, the Wirtz family. You know, obviously Ed Snyder, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Illich. You know, in Detroit, uh, Al Davis. Uh, you know, even even the Sullivans who own the Patriots, you know, uh, before Robert Kraft, uh, it was a different day then. Um, and I was fortunate to, to be part of it and, and fortunate, frankly, to work for uh, a guy like Ed Snyder, who, who literally, as I would start a company, um, literally gave me pieces of those as a reward for, for starting the company. And that just doesn't happen. So as you know, and we all know, uh, big part of your life is is timing and, and and the people you meet along the way absolutely i'm so excited to have you peter um as our guest today on our 76 capital leadership series I and mean, we have peter luco you know now chairman of the oakview group facilities and co-chairman of ovg's arena alliance and all the other things that you've done and you think back to some of the things that you did when you were in philly with ed snyder and um you know are there are there certain moments that you, you really cherish um, that you can kind of share with us? Yeah, like from the facility end, um, you know, you, you're going to laugh at this one. John LeClaire playing for Team USA in the World Cup, scoring our first goal, uh, going to the Stanley Cup finals twice. But uh, professionally, a lot of it is just some of the, the great moments uh, I had with Ed. Um, you know, Ed came into my office talk about a game changer and this was we were at the spectrum building new arena and he said listen you're a great business person you're probably the best facility guy in, in the world peter but i you're my entrepreneur like i don't have an entrepreneur you've got that entrepreneurial spirit and you're much like me when i was your age you feel like you have to make this every decision you, f you feel that you have to be in every meeting and and if you could delegate more you could use your mind to create businesses and, and do other things. And, you know, one for Ed to be so humble and say, well, you remind me of me. And he just had a way of getting into my thick athletic skin. Like, you know, my, that brain that didn't sometimes want to stubbornness. Uh, but for him to, to sit there with me, be so humble. And there's two ways you could go. You could go, Hey, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I thank God chose the right way and my feet never touched the ground and it was like one of the greatest moments in my life um and and and, and that was the the ed that publicly maybe people didn't didn't know i mean he you never worked for Ed. you worked with it i mean you never felt like an employee with him it was just amazing how he could be and uh just i'll tell you one funny story the crazy one that just came to mind but we're on an airplane and, and you know fred shaver wayne and uh we were there was phil Weinberg, Cindy Lipstein, and we were kind of the offices of the company. So we're on Ed's jet and, you know, what a, such a privilege, right? You just, so Fred, you know, being the chairman and the thinker he was says, you know, many companies, uh, you know, they don't allow all their officers to be on a plane together because if a plane went down, you know, it, it would be a real problem and a real problem to succession. So I, you know, I'm, I'm being a wise guy, I look at Fred and I go, well, then you go commercial. So, so, so Ed looks at us and he goes, Fred, why would we care? Care? We'd all be dead. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that was Ed. We were a team, you know, like we weren't corporate. We weren't worried about all that. We were just who we were and each, we all had our role. Um, and that's the other thing I learned from Ed is use your resources. Um, you know, he, he had said, don't wish, you know, use your legal people, use your finance people, you know, use the people that have these disciplines, let them finish the deals and you go on to the next one. Um, and that's one area that Ed was great. Um, again, being as powerful he was in the, and like, and again, I said just that look of Ed, but I, I, one of the greatest things I learned from Ed Snyder was um, how to use resources. I mean, there was no, he was in his listening skills. You know, a lot of people look at a powerful man and, think that ed just would tell you what to do he never told me i had to do something now he had suggestions and he had ideas and if you were smart 
you would say, wow, that was a heck of an idea that maybe I ought to go in his direction. It's probably a little better than mine, but he never came in the office and said, you will do this. Um, another great lesson to learn. And one thing I've learned over the years, you know, when you've had is, you know, one point we had over 5,000 employees, uh, the more people you employ, the more you work for them, they don't work for you. You've got to be there to support them. You have to, when there's an issue or a problem, you want them to think of you first to solve their problem, not, you know, not holy shit, man, I got to call that guy now because he's going to scream at me. So that's something you really learn is, you know, how to be your best and be a good resource and a mentor for people. And I think at this stage in my career, that's probably the most exciting thing we're, I'm doing right now. That's really tremendous advice. And I'll tell you, you know, one of the things which has been fascinating, I'd love to hear more about it is, you know, all the different businesses that were created under, you know, the Flyers, right? The Philadelphia Flyers, the NHL team, you know, the, you, you mentioned that um, Ed was able to go and get the, the spectrum um, and have that become an asset and then build, then you built um, a, an arena business and stadium business around that. But then there's all those other things that, that go along to running an arena or a stadium. And you went into a lot of those businesses over time. Yeah, we, we you know, one thing we've, we thought about, and, and this was our second time in the facility business, was how do we import our knowledge and, 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 and most importantly, give our people the opportunity to grow. So if you're just in Philly, we had to get outside of Philly because obviously there's only one arena and one team and all that. Um, and how do we give a path and create a culture so people feel that they can can grow? So we were able to create a culture that was incredible because we were providing growth. And and frankly, one thing you do learn is as you get older is is you don't really fire people; they fire themselves. So if you create a culture that's hardworking, uh, rewarding, and 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 teamwork, then someone who isn't within that realm just doesn't survive. So we were able to create that culture and, and, and not only just get into obviously arenas, but stadiums. Uh, we managed, uh, you know, back to Three River Stadium, the Cardinal Stadium, you, you, you name it, but also convention centers, theaters, uh, having great partners along the way, which is obviously a partner of many of our deals now in Live Nation. Uh, but working with local promoters at the time before they were consolidated. but And then using our, our hockey relationships. A lot of these uh, facilities had either NHL teams or minor league teams or junior teams. And I, I was able to cross over to sit with the owners and, the, and their staff because they looked at me as the flyer guy, not the facility guy. Uh, so you learn to wear a lot of hats. I'd go to meetings and I'd say to John Page, you're the, you're the facility guy. I'm the, I'm the hockey guy today, you know. Uh, and we, we were able to, to really, uh, to trade, you know, er, early on off of, of the relationships that we had and, and, and obviously all led by Ed because he was an icon in the business. Absolutely. And one of the things which I, I remember, you know, was, I thought was such an interesting and bold move was when you, uh, built Xfinity live, um, right next to the Wells Fargo center. Yeah, that, that, you know, when we uh, did the deal with Ed Rendell uh, to build a new arena, we acquired development rights on those parking lots. And it took us more than 10 years because, you know, we, we had potential movie theaters and like, you know, who wants to go to the movies when, you know, there's a, a Phillies, Eagles, Flyers, Sixer game and pay to park. And we just couldn't find the right fit. And then um, Ed, Ed actually had met David, David Cordish at an event in Washington and said, you might want to talk to this guy. So I went down and spoke with David Cordish and he was beginning and he'd done one in Kansas City, another one in St. Louis. They were creating these live zones. So we, we did a partnership with David and basically built 80,000 square feet of bars and, and restaurants. Um, and, and it was incredibly successful because we used the promotional machine of the Flyers, the Sixers, the concerts, our database. Uh, we would do promotions where we during a flyer game, we would we would take a, a camera shot over to Xfinity Live and we would take four four uh, fans from there and sit them on the glass. So people go to Xfinity Live thinking maybe they could get chosen to be at a game. Uh, and it became a destination for all the Philly sports where people would go even if they didn't have tickets. Um, and then the concerts and the like. But yeah, that was a great achievement. And I, I know Ed was proud. I was really proud of, of what we did there. And um, 
the immediate success that we had was uh, was unprecedented. We, the one thing that, and nobody's done this yet, the one thing Ed and I really wanted to do also was build a, a hotel there. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, but it was such a hard business that we didn't know it enough. That we, every time we did, you'll love this, Wayne, every time we did the calculation, we, we were actually making more money on the parking spaces than we would have made at the hotel. <laughs> so so we, we never got there, but but uh, maybe Dave Scott and the crew there will, will figure it out in the, in the future at some point. Oh, uh, absolutely. Well, one, one last thing on Philly. I, it, you know, I, I think one of the things you were also really responsible for were the winter classics that were uh, played in Philly. Yeah. How did that all come about? I mean, it was just a, such great, you know, the way you guys pulled it off. Well, you know, I, when they first came out um, and, and our first one, we actually went to Fenway and I was like that little kid with Gary Bettman, you know, the one who keeps going to his mom, can I have a dollar? 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 <laughs> I was like, can I ever win a classic? Can I ever win a classic? So I badgered him. Um, and we had such a great market. So uh, the league gave us the winter classic against the New York Rangers. But I think what we did, and I think we were all proud of this, uh, and, and Sean Tilger played such a big part in that too, and all of our staff. But we asked Gary uh, if we could do the alumni game because it was sort of a throwaway in the early winter classics where they would just open up the building, have an alum alumni game, you know, maybe do 10,000 people. And it was kind of a fun pre-event. We thought it was bigger than that, and especially playing the Rangers. So uh, we did the Flyer alumni versus the Rangers. Um, I, 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 it was so much fun. I remember sitting with Paul Holmgren, and we were like choosing lines because we wanted somebody from every de decade. So we had the LCB line from, you know, Clarkie's days with Billy Barber and Reggie Leach. And then, you know, we had, you know, Brian Prop in his line. Uh, you know, we got me and Mark Howe come back. We had, you know, the Legion of Doom. So we were getting people from sort of every generation of flyer. It was so much fun. But we went on sale and sold it out uh, and, and grossed $2 million. Now, lessons learned. The league took it back after that year. But, but we literally did a $2 million gross. And it was probably the highlight of the Winter Classic because of the, you know, the Rangers playing, you know, the Flyers. And, and I remember um, it, um, uh, one of the, uh, Ron Duguay uh, coming down on a breakaway on, uh, on, on Bernie Perrant. And it, he, he hit Bernie's pads, right? So after the game, I'm like, hey, Ron, do you have a minute? Like, I thought that was the classiest thing. I've ever seen. He goes, Hey, Peter, I wasn't doing anybody a favor. I know if I scored, I'd, I'd still never make it out alive in Philadelphia, <laughs> which you know, just shows you how the respect and the fans in Philly and how passionate they are. Uh, and then we sold out the American League game and grossed a million dollars. So we literally, and I think it's the only time it's fun, literally done. I think we sold out three games. We also had high school games. Um, we had public skating. We had, you know, people could just do a pickup game. Uh, and we kept the ice uh, longer than any other winter classic had. And, and, you know, everybody in Philly sort of had a chance to be as, as Ed always had it. We, we were the flyer family, everybody, no matter how good or bad you were as a skater, everybody had a chance to, to participate and, and work at, uh, in, you know, skate at citizens bank ballpark. And, you know, another special really thanks, at that time, and, and it's sad that he's he's no longer with us. But uh, Dave Montgomery was one of the classiest guys Wayne I've ever met in my life. Uh, he embraced the Winter Classic. We ended up uh, managing his stadium and booking concerts there. But uh, you know, to see even a guy from another sport having so much fun and seeing the Philly staff there, so it really wasn't a flyer event. It was a Philly event, and and I think uh, the more I think about it, that that. That talk about highlighting a career to be to be part of that was just incredibly special. Well, it's really great and special to have you as our as our special guest today on our Seventies Capital Leadership Series, and we're here with Peter Luco. And Peter, you after spending all this you know, almost twenty five years right in, in Philadelphia, um, you went down to Florida with the Florida Panthers, and how did that happen? It was great. Um, it was about it was a little after. A, a year I had, had left and Gary Bettman 
had talked to him about a couple other teams and um, it, this, this is actually a great story because he said, listen, you know, Florida needs, the owner needs some help down there and uh, I'd like you to go. And I'm like, geez, you know, I don't know. I've only been gone a year. The Flyers on, aren't in the playoffs. You know, I'm, I get these strange calls. Like maybe I wanted to head in one direction and there was a rift with Ed and I, and frankly, I don't want to, I have so much respect for Ed. I don't know if it's the right thing to do. And he goes, well, I need you to think about it because you've turned a couple of jobs down. You know, and if you turn another one down, no one may call. And I go, yeah, I'll think about it. So it, Gary calls me the next day and it said, Ed says it's okay. I said, well, of course he's going to say it's okay. <laughs> I mean, he's not going to say no. So uh, anyway, I went down there. Great experience. You know, every day you do learn something. And to be with a failing franchise, a great new owner in Vinnie Viola, um, we were able to get it up to 15,600 paid. Uh, we won our division, uh, worked with Dale Talon, um, talked about a fortunate person to, to literally work in your career. you the, the three GMs you work with are Bob Clark, Paul Holmgren and Dale Talon. I mean, talk about the layup, uh, you know, three of the most, all different personalities, but, but stone call winners and three of the best hockey men ever. Um, so that was so much fun, but. Uh, while I was there is when Irving and Tim approached me and, uh, they were started in Oakview group. Uh, I, I go back to 1985 with Irving. Uh, we were partners with Irving and MCA records, uh, as the manager of the LA Coliseum, uh, incredible man, probably the most powerful, uh, manager in music, you know, the Eagles, Fleetwood Mac, uh, you know, Harry Sheen, all on and on and on. I mean, the, the acts that he, Bon Jovi, um, and then Tim was kind of, a, was really a competitor with AEG, but a dear friend. And we used to go to like, and he would bug our guys because I'd go to meetings and Tim and I would go to dinner, you know, uh, and, and talk about a brilliant facility guy and, and a, a force of nature. I've never met a guy like him. Um, and they said, would you like to join the band? You know, I want to, and Tim had called me two, two years before and said, you and I are going to work together. He was at Maple Leaf Sports. He said, I'm going to leave here. We're going to work together. And I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, well, we are. And um, we created the Arena Alliance. First, and crazy as this sounds, first time in the history of the business that we had aligned the biggest arenas in the country. So from Boston to Philly to Washington, Charlotte, Fort Lauderdale, Tampa, you know, Denver, L.A., uh, Sacramento, Portland, uh, on and on and on. So really, for the we don't manage them, but for the – we. We help them coordinate their bookings. Uh, we have a, a young man by the name of Eric Gardner who routes a lot of earnings towards the sells to Live Nation. Uh, Live Nation is a huge supporter, so we don't promote against Live Nation. In fact, we work closely with them. So we, we work to increase the bookings in these facilities and bring non-traditional sponsors. So we did a $40 million, $40 million deal with Walmart. We did a PetSmart deal. Uh, uh, Zoom, believe it or not, Zoom. Now, I'll tell you how dumb I am. I, I should have bought the stock then, but, you know, I couldn't figure out how to use it, you know, uh, and, and, and normal sponsors other than your car deal, beer deal, you know, soda deal, uh, do that. So we started that. And then, and then of course, you know, why not do it again? We got back in the facility business, uh, but in a bigger way than I had ever been, uh, uh, personally, uh, we're building the arena in Seattle. We're 50, 50 partners with the hockey team, you know, the Kraken, uh, we're building the arena in Belmont. We're 50-50 partners with the Islanders. Um, we're, we're building the arena at, at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, with, we're 50-50 part, partners with the uh, university. Uh, we're building an arena in Savannah, Palm Springs. We're, we're also managing arenas on a fee basis or even a lease basis. Uh, so there's no deal we won't do. You know, we never, sometimes we think there's never, we've never met a deal we don't like, which is a bit dangerous, but uh we're just finishing up a deal to um, manage the ASU arena for their division one hockey team, which has been an incredible success story. Uh, so we got back in the facility business. Then we have preventive partners. We have a sponsorship division. So we're big in the security sanitization. Um, and then, uh, you know, our conferences that we do in Polestar magazine. So uh, Silver Lake is, is our equity partner. Uh, and they've been a fantastic part, fantastic to the point where, uh, some of our competition is furloughed people, laid people off during this time. We have not. And we've picked up, you know, 12 new deals during this period because we've been aggressive. So 
but that's Tim, that's Irving, that's Silver Lake. That's, that's how we all think, you know, is play to win. And we know we're coming out of this. Uh, and we just want to come out of it in a big way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and speaking of that, I mean, I think one of the interesting things that you and your partners at, at OVG did was, was this idea of helping to really create the bubble, right? Yeah. For the NHL in, in both. Um, I mean, that was, that was amazing, both in Toronto and Edmonton. And how did that all come together? Well, when this started, um, you know, we really wanted to get right away, figure out a way, how are we going to get back? How are we going to provide a safe environment? And rather than wait for government to tell us what they thought, we thought we've got to get ahead of this uh, and be supportive of our government and get into the science and the sanitization. Um, you know, uh, Tim is so passionate about this, uh, myself, uh, others. Uh, so early on when I was getting information, I was sending it to Gary and saying, you know, Gary, this is what we're seeing for testing. This is what we're seeing for products for sanitization. So as they began to create the bubble, we began to have conversations with the NHL as to how we could help them and, and be a supplement to their staff. Because, you know, as you know, I mean, it, it, it is, it, leagues are interesting. They, they, don't, they don't really run arenas or stadiums. They do put on some events, obviously. But we were really hired to supplement their 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 efforts and help create the bubble which we did in edmonton and toronto and then we were the compliance officers for the protocols masks sanitization testing uh making sure that once the bubble was set up that the hotels were doing the proper spacing in their restaurants uh, that that people were wearing masks that we were getting test results from everybody in the bubble um on a regular basis and just the general protocols of, of, of keeping the environment safe, um, right down to making sure that, that the deliveries of product were safe um, so that, that nothing could enter this bubble and af affect the players. Uh, and and that, that what it was a great assignment. Um, we had five people in each city. I spent the first 35 days in Toronto um, through the early rounds and then, and then left after, the, the field had narrowed down a bit, but um, great experience for our staff. Uh, thankful that we were, that Gary had some faith in us, uh, but, but a lot of lessons learned coming out of it, which will help our industry, um, which I think is probably the most, most important thing that, that we learned there. But, you know, when the players were unbelievable, uh, which tells you something about the sport and I, I am very biased, but they were so happy to be back playing. And then the socialization aspect, because when you think about it, at that time, especially, there wasn't much socialization going on in, in North America. So now all of a sudden, you've got over 600 team officials in each city seeing each other on a daily basis. And uh, a lot of us who had played as kids say it was like the greatest peewee tournament ever. <laughs> you know, like, and that's what it was. Everyone was back to their roots. It was a tournament. You see your opposition, you know, you're trying to, you know, kill each other on the ice. And then, you know, you're, you're having a beer with them or talking in the lobby the next day. So it, it was a lot of fun to see the stars and some of the great executives of the games just, you know, hanging out. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing what you did. And it certainly, um, it, from a viewer perspective and, and, and a fan, I mean, it, it's been, it's, it's been flawless. Um, and so that's, that's, yeah. knock on wood, you just a couple games left, but it's, it's, it's been good. Uh, you know, the Canadian government was tough, uh, but very fair. Um, and, you know, if you look what they've done in Canada, they've, they've done a heck of a job. And um, so, so they, it, what what Gary and the staff didn't show did not want, they did not want anybody breaking protocols so that we would lose the faith of the Canadian government. And, you know, obviously, most importantly, the health and welfare of the employees and the players and all that. But so there was a, there was a little bit of pressure there to make sure that we lived up to what, what everybody had agreed to. And as we did that, um, the Canadian government was very good with the league and began to maybe let them do some other things like outings uh, and other things for the players because the league had been so diligent um, in, in adhering to those protocols. Well, Peter, it's been, it's been really great having you on the show. You've given us so much 
you know, so many really interesting things to think about from a business perspective within sports, from the perspective of all the things that you've done in your career. And, you know, the one last thing I want to ask you is really this, what do you see as next? When you really think about sports today and, the, and how technology and new sports are sort of coming into the world of the traditional sports world, what do you think's next? And where, where do you think we're all, this is all going? It's going to be all about the technology. The, the, the beauty of sports and entertainment is that you'll never replace the live experience. So we, we will live forever as an industry. Um, it just people, and you see it now, they need to socialize and have fun. Uh, and they want to do that together. We're social animals. But it, for probably 30 or 40 years, it was arena and stadium design. Are you adding clubs and suites? And, you know, early buildings did not have, they had one concourse, makeshift suites, no clubs. It was the the architectural physical design. Now the star, and, and Wayne, to your credit, you're in it, is the technology. It, it is how are we going to be through applications or, or, or other means, how are people going to get this instant information while they're viewing it? Uh, I, and, 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 and the sports gambling and how is that going to, you know, integrate in, into uh, what we do in, in your game experience? Because, you know, every generation is smarter, bigger, faster, stronger, right? So people, you know, multitasking sounds like a phrase, but it's the truth. People are doing all kinds of things while they're watching for years people just watch the game in fact you could shoot a cannon through the concourse you know during a flyer game and not hit anybody now you know people that it's just part of the experience is the game it's the focus but what information can i get what other kinds of fun how do i get my food how do i get my merchandise am i am i making prop bets you know uh, are we going to a game and and Four of us are betting on who makes, you know, who scores the first goal at what time, but all that kind of stuff. So to me, and I, I wish I had the answer because I'd get in that business, but it's going to be <laughs> the technology. And, and because of that, I think it's the greatest time in sports to be young and getting in this business because you bring something to the table. I didn't bring anything to the table. You had to pay your dues and, you know, you bought media and you, there were three, you know, four TV stations in a marketplace. But the way that, that uh, young people now navigate through the various mediums, uh, my brain doesn't do that. I didn't grow up with that. Uh, theirs does. And so they actually come in and, and right away they're great marketers because they know how to speak to other people in today's mediums. So uh, mediums, technology, go young. I think that's the future. Well, I got to disagree with you for a little bit because your brain does work that way. <laughs> right. We've done a pretty, some incredible things. And by the way, one of the things which we didn't mention was was with the 50-50 game, which is really almost the beginning of, of sports betting. And, and you and you were one of the leaders of that. Great, great. It's a great concept. It's, you know, huge in Canada, probably up into the Northeast. It's just, you know, with somebody for charity, you know, you buy 20 tickets and 50%, the winner, 50% goes to the charity, 50 to the winner. And um, what we did was digi digitize it and um, make it so that people would begin to see the progressive pot through the scoreboard or, or ribbon boards, or what have you. And it's like anything else, the simple stuff is the stuff that makes money and works. People would watch that progressive pot and see it go from 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 and just keep buying these tickets. Uh, so our, our average pot in Philly was, uh, was $60,000, $70,000 a game. So we, we had a new medium that was raising, you know, somewhere a million, a million and a half a charity. So we just did it. It's funny you say during the bubble in Edmonton and it was a progressive pot over days. 14 million dollars wow. seven million dollars went to the winner uh it just went crazy uh people were watching tv and the, the league promoted it um but it, again it's something that just using technology and it and it, as simple as it is where in the old days where somebody was walking around with an apron and a bunch of tickets this was all electronic people see the pot and say hey it's the end of, you know it's the end of the second period it's at 55 grand i'm also giving it a shot 
And then you're doing good. You're raising money for charity, which, you know, you can't beat that. Well, it's great to have you. You you do great things for not only for sports, but just in general in the community and in, in and around the whole, you know, all of North America. So thanks for all that you do within sports and everything else and your leadership as being one of the one of the guys that we can all look up to in the sports industry means a lot to me and to many of us. So again, thanks for joining our show, Peter. And uh, it's awesome to have you. I mean, again, what you're doing now, best of luck with everything with the Oakview Group. Um, you know, your your career with the Flyers, the Panthers, Comcast Spectacor, Ed Snyder, just incredible stories, incredible things that you've done. And uh, wish you the best of luck in the future. And I, and, and I hope that we're going to do some more things together in the future. Well, that's what I was going to say. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm humbled. It's very nice of you. But uh, I'm actually looking even more forward to our next conference call, trying to get some deals done, Wayne. <laughs> Uh, that would be great. That would be great. Well, thanks, Peter. Really appreciate it. Thank and you, you can catch 70, our, our 76 Capital uh, Leadership Series on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and on YouTube as well. You can follow us at 76 Capital and follow me, Wayne Kimmel. James, great job back at the controls. Um, definitely um, subscribe to our podcast, whether it's on Spotify, Anchor, or on Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, these are really um, great lessons great things that you can learn about the world of sports. So once again, uh, today's guest was uh, Peter Luco. Thank you so much for being here.